Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's meeting. Before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity once again to open your word together. We invite your Holy Spirit to instruct us, to correct us, and to lead and guide us along this path. We need your presence throughout the day. And we just ask, Lord, that as we come together here this morning, that uh, you, we can unite with you and with one another in understanding and in purpose. Help us to understand these passages in Judges 16 and their application for today. And be with each person, bless them, may your angels watch over them. And may you lead us into all truth. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so um, yesterday we began uh, laying down the, the formalization and basically mostly the empowerment of the, the first angel's message in relationship to, to Samson. Now, what we haven't done is placed uh, the verses that uh, give us that. We did with the arrival of the first message. We have uh, the 777 being symbolized and um, that period of time. And Stephen 777 at the end of those 777 days. And then we addressed more in detail um, the formalization with Odilio's presentation in the 1629. And, and then we addressed um, uh, the formalization or the empowerment with um, the study. Basically, this would have been uh, my study on November, dealing with November 24th, 2022. So that 2688 became that. Uh, application for the additional extension of time in the Canadian or the Canadian American tax form. So, <clears throat> so that 2688 is an interesting symbol and we're going to look at that a little bit more. Now, what we, in order to look at, um, obviously we know with 16 verse one, that's going to give us the end of the 777 structure. We use Gaza there uh, to do that because that's going to tie us to um, uh, Gaza is going to tie us to the, the Battle of Raphia. So we have to figure out how that relates, but also just the fact it's 16 verse 1. So that's going to be the wave sheaf and then the way that we put Odilio's is that was uh, following the wave sheaf, you have Pentecost. And so we put Odilio's study there as Pentecost seven weeks later. <clears throat> so um, let's look at these verses a little, a little more closely and try to see what, what's happening in this story. And it was told the Gazite saying, Samson has come hither and they compassed him in and laid wait for him all the night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night saying in the morning when it is day we shall kill him so what is this scene here in judges 16 2 symbol what is it symbolically representing so we know samson is a type of christ morally ironic and we have this symbol of um this nighttime, he's compassed about in this city, and they're going to wait in the gate of the city, right? And they're planning that in the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. So what is this scene, um, and how, how are we applying it on our life? Uh, 
Well, I'm thinking there's some relation to. Go ahead, Stephen. No, I was just thinking about the the times when Christ um, was, in a sense, uh, going to be killed, but it wasn't his time, and he escaped the hands of whoever it was, trying to throw him off a cliff or mm -hmm. sort of similar incidents. So, yeah, um, that yeah. comes to mind. The plottings. Yeah, the plottings to kill Christ. Right, is that what you were thinking? No, I was also, also thinking of uh, Judges 9.32, where Z Zebul is plotting plotting against Gaal. Yeah, okay. Laying in line until the sun comes up and then attack <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Now, um, so we got this, they're, they're compassed about... <clears throat> Now I, I think of Psalm thirty two or Psalm twenty two. <clears throat> right. So that's the one uh <clears throat> um that's gonna be which verse. I think it's Psalm 22. Yeah, I think it talks about the bulls of Bashan or something. Go yeah, where see. is that? <clears throat> I yeah, I think that is, that is Psalm 22. Yeah. 22, 12. Oh, there it is. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. <clears throat> so, um, now what, what does this verse mean? Like, why are they called the strong bulls? I mean, this is... <coughs> oh, sorry. Sorry about that. So, who? what are the bulls of Bashan? Yeah. What are they? Just looking up this word, and this word uh, "compassed" here uh, it means to turn about. It's based on uh, "shuv." The word "shuv" uh, is related to it. It's not the word. Uh, yeah, it's the word here in Judges sixteen two. It's the same word. Five four three seven. Sabab. <clears throat> anyway, so the bulls of Bashan, we know Bashan is a uh, place it's first mentioned in Numbers 32 33. Um, that's Og, king of Bashan, right? So this is uh, part of the, of who they conquered, right? It's kind of odd here in Psalm 22 to, to sort of see this, especially in connection with Christ. And many bulls here. Um, this is a bullock. So this has to do with the strength, right? Uh, the, the idea of a bull is something that's strong. And, and, and they could have been instead of strong bulls of baby, on mighty bulls of Bashan or the chief bulls of Bashan um, have beset me round. <clears throat> so anyway, this reminds us of, and, and it says, for dogs have compassed me about as well. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Of course, we know Psalm 22 is the cross. But the bulls of Bashan, yeah, is this not referring to a region to the east of the Jordan? Yeah, yeah. And who occupied the east of the Jordan? Well, um, you mean prior to the Israelites coming? Right. Uh, well, those are going to be the, the Amorites. All right. 
So are we not seeing this in a symbolic manner that this is where the the bulls of Bashan encompassing them would that not be like the Protestants being all the way around with the way that they wish to apply their teachings? Um, hmm. I don't know. Um, well, like you're going through this again, I mean, like the Sunday law, like the Sunday law, maybe if that's what you're saying. You can apply it that way, yes. So here, here you've got Judges 16, too, in the symbolic. Yes, Samson is being applied in the ironic, but you have the, the symbolism that he is down closer to Egypt. And at midnight, they're waiting for him. Mm hmm but at midnight when he arises, when the message comes to its full force, yeah. he removes the doors and the gates of the city. Now, can't we apply something there from what we learned about Jericho? Okay, what, what would you do with Jericho? <clears throat> Was there not a curse laid upon Jericho by Joshua? Yeah. And the curse that was laid upon Jericho was upon the man that sets the foundation and the what? Uh, the gate. Okay. So Samson is removing the gate which is what has been the name of those that have opposed his mes message. Mm -hmm. Would that be possible? Well, that would be possible. So he's going to take the name Seventh-day Adventist and set it upon the hill in Hebrew. So in taking the name and setting it up upon a hill, is that not like taking the light from under the basket or taking the light that has been hidden within the pitcher and smashing the pitcher so that everybody can see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because those two, Jesus puts them together. You know, you don't hide your light under a bushel. Right. Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> so, so when we look at this this story here, we have sixteen one, so that's going to give us the wave offering. Sixteen two is going to refer back to. Uh, the period of the falling of the manna, right? So it's going to begin on the 16th day of the second month and be cease falling on the 16th day of the first month, 40 years later. Okay. And and we tie this together then um, symbolically in the chart when we addressed uh, Samson and we addressed November 24th, um, we use that number, right, of the, the falling of the manna. We found that it, it brought us from uh, a symbolic date, July 7th, 1994, um, to that April 5th, 2030 date. <clears throat> Why is that? doesn't even make sense. No, that's not right. Not July 7th. It's going to bring us to April 26, 1990. That's better. Um, right. So I'm going to try to deal with these verses and, and, and place these symbols, why we place them where we do. So 
yeah, here we have the 14,588 exclusive days going from this April 26, 1990 date, which is <clears throat> one week after November 9th, 1989, if we take the days as representing hours. <clears throat> Yeah, so Angela's putting July 18th in there. Um, though I don't know if I'd put July 18th. <clears throat> and, and maybe we could, because I'm still trying to sort through how to put these on a line. But we did get international. What I was saying, yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, what I was saying was when, uh, when Dwight had commented something about blowing blowing the trumpet and breaking the breaking the pictures, I looked up the verse and I noticed it was Judges 7, 19. So I thought, well, July 19th of 20, we started re-examining where we were and whether we still thought, thought that, that 7, 18 was valid. And we went on from there. Okay. I, just <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so we have uh, definitely, you know, we have that in, in that history the way that we've drawn out this line, though, is we didn't start uh, before, uh, you know, the end of our period. We started at the end of the 777 days. So, so those are all included in that, that 777 days, <clears throat> right? That's the way that I'm looking at Judges, Judges 16. I could be wrong, but... I, I see this as happening at the end of the 777 days that he goes down to Gaza. It's not at the beginning. But it's going to have material in it that references back into the past. Right? So, and, and the way that it's referenced back is Colin's study, Odilio's study, and my study. Right. That's the way that I've understood this. <clears throat> so you can see when when we deal with my study, which is the two, six, eight, eight. Right. That's going to be uh, addressing this November 24th, 2022 date. It. Um, We, we, we was dealing with these anniversaries. So the anniversaries, of course, is this Thanksgiving date. And we also have um, this 1,629 days, which comes from Odilio study, going back to June 9th, 2018. Um, and we have, uh, going back to November 9th, 2019, is... 1111 days that's Daniel chapter 1111 so of course that's going to be addressing uh Raphia on November 9th 2019 we understood to be Raphia um then the 168 days on either side here with November 24th 2022 if we go back with this from April 5th, 2030, it brings us back 168 days after November 9th, 1989. And it gives us this 26 day of the fourth month symbol. Right. So there was just all of these numeric connections, symbolic connections that um, uh, we, we just can't really ignore them. And then, of course, the 2688, that's going to be that additional application for the additional extension of time on the American tax uh, for filing your taxes, right? And um, so that's going to be November 24th. And so I'm saying that that's the empowerment of these studies that we've done that are going to be in the line of Samson and Delilah, uh, the first angel's message. Right. So here we have them. <clears throat> so that's the way we we finished this yesterday. Now, this number here is interesting. Um, so I'm just going to put here IRS. And I'm going to put this number here. 
So what's the Hebrew number 2688? It's not in this verse, but it is symbolically represented in this verse. So if we look up the Hebrew number 2688, um, let's go up here. <clears throat> a palm tree. Yeah, dividing uh, the palm tree. Into Jericho. Yeah. So it comes from two different words. Because uh, um, <clears throat> it's Chetzon uh, Tamar, Hazon Tamar. It's the name of a city. Um, and the word Chetzat. Uh, uh, means uh, to um, cut off in the midst is one of the ways it's understood. Also to shoot an arrow, archer and band. So it has a bit of uh, broad meaning. Uh, properly to chop into, pierce or sever. Right. And um, of course, Tamar's just referring to the palm. But the word itself comes from a root meaning to erect. So one of the things we see in the week of Christ's study <clears throat> is that this is about the cross in the midst where Christ is cut off, right? Does that make sense to people? Agreed. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking at this word here. So, katats, katats, it doesn't show up very often. Judges 5 11, Proverbs 30 27, uh, Job 21 21. Uh, it says, For what pleasure hath he in his house after him when the number of his months is cut off in the midst? And so it has the symbol for midnight being doubled and uh, the number of his months is cut off in the midst. So can that refer to Christ, to the crucifixion, to the cross? Potentially. Yeah. It's also in Job 21, 21. Oh, no, it's just twice in there. What am I saying? It's the same verse, but it mentions it twice. Uh, so the word, well, why do they do it that way? So cut off in the midst. So the word must be there uh, twice here. I'm just going to look at this verse uh, in Hebrew. Just see why they have it there twice. So it must be there twice. It doesn't make sense. I'm not sure why they do that because I don't see the word there twice. Don't know what Strong's is doing there. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so <clears throat> for some reason they mention it twice. Oh, cut off in the midst. I see. It's just there's two different words that that are that it's using to translate that word. That's what it means. Okay. So we get two different English words, cut off or cut in the midst. I, I don't know why they do it that way. But anyway, <clears throat> so that's Job 21, 21. So, so we have all of these symbols that lead us to this understanding of the cross that are connected with the November 24th date. Is that making sense to people? I mean, I'm not doing a very good job of explaining things, but I think it should be seen, should be clear that we can take this, <clears throat> this story. What's being illustrated is the cross, the plottings against Christ. And, um, and then we have the symbol of midnight, right? Now, 
Now, the word midnight is 2677. So 2688 is that number of days that we have from November 24th, uh, 2022 to um, April 5th, 2030. So this is this number here is obviously not the same number. Uh, but the word itself is related. Now, this word occurs 126 times in the King James. <laughs> right. And um, <clears throat> it means midnight means in the midst or half. So it's actually related to that word uh, uh, cut off. So we can see that even though the word 2688 is not in this verse, we have this related word. And we can see that when it says midnight here, it's going to have the middle of the night. The word for night is 3915. Lila, right? That's going to be night. And so the middle of the night is midnight. Okay, does that make sense? How we can see all of these symbols tied together in these verses. Any thoughts on this? Any further? Amazing. 3195, huh? 3, 391.5. Yeah, exactly. Right. So we have that symbol. And remember, it's the 391.5 that brought us to November 9th, 2019. And so all of these are referring us back to this previous history of the 777, which includes all of those symbols that are, were, were used in there. Uh, you know, the publication of the prediction, uh, July 18th itself, um, right? So you're going to just see all of these, these symbols tied together in these few verses. So to me, it's, it's unmistakable that we're going to take this November 24th, 2022 date as this empowerment, because it, it is something that ties the week of Christ study, which of course is about the crucifixion to this April 3rd or April 5th, 2030 date. It ties these verses tie us to the whole 777 structure and the events that occurred there. But it's going to be these studies, Colin studies, Odilio study, and I'm saying my study, it's our study. But <clears throat> I'm, and, and really, I think it was Iran who noticed the 2688 as being this symbolic number, right? So, so it's all of our studies, right? But you can see. That, that these all tie together. So this November 24th, 2022 date is was the empowerment of all of this. Yeah, so today is April 5th, uh, uh, by the way, as a, uh, Angela's pointing out. And um, so that's seven years uh, to the day that we're mentioning this, but you know, I mean, we could have mentioned it in connection with other studies. <laughs> But, but that's, you know, it's just something that we're, we're understanding at this time. So we got seven, seven years till April 5th, 2030. Any other thoughts? So that was a, a good point there, Angela. And of course, the Genesis 15, the severing of the beasts in half, right? So, of course, that's the whole thing of the chiasm to begin with. So we have all of these things to tie us back. We have just so many symbols here in these few verses. And even when we look, he carried them to the top of a hill. That's going to be July 18th, Right? And, and the word top, of course, is 7218. That's all the, the numbers of July 18, 2020. Right.
So I don't know what else here that we could look at other than we're going to take these verses and uh, the way that I would look at them if we're going to put them on this slide, uh, just as I wouldn't say it's an oversimplification, but it's it's not necessarily complete, uh, but we're going to put the verses, and I would just say we're going to take um, this one. We'll put as it's still kind of six ver sixteen verse one because that's what's marking the end of it. Oops, can't capitalize numbers. <clears throat> and um, I'm going to put 16 verse 2 and then 16 verse 3. That's the way I would look at these first three. I mean, it's it's not as straightforward, it is easily divisible as that by these verses, but just generally, that's what's going to be emphasized. <clears throat> okay. So that brings us up to November 24th, 2022. And then we have a message that arrives um, after this. So it came to pass afterward that those that loved a woman, that, <clears throat> that he loved a woman in the Valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. So um, this would be a message that arrives afterwards. So a message arrives. That's the second angel. It has to be 16, verse 4. Or does it? Now, we had done it when we had done the line of Judges 15. Uh, we had put 16, verse 4 as November 9th, 2019. Um, and... I'll just show you this here. So this was this line where we had put this wave offering and Pentecost, right, from Judges 16.1 and Judges 15.1. So we are mixing these two together. And then we had Judges 16, verse 4, as November 9th, 2019, which, of course, isn't in order, <clears throat> right? It's not in order of the, the other dates. So we were just uh, putting what we believe these symbols meant, and but we put November 9th, 2019 after, which doesn't make any sense to me at the present moment, but that's what we did, right? But we're saying that Judges 16, verse 4, is referring to a message that in the line of Samson and Delilah is the arrival of the second message. So we'd have to place where that verse is and what that message is. What is this him now falling in love with Delilah? What is this about? So there's what we did, whether that made sense or not, I can't remember, but that's how we did it. So now when we look at this line, we're going to say that this is 16 verse 4. And we haven't really figured out what it is yet, what the date is. Now, interesting thing, of course, about the name Delilah. Hebrew number 1807, right? <clears throat> okay, but... I think there's there's two things that need to be considered here. Okay. I agree with you. We should be 
considering the situation with Delilah because of its numerical portent, but also the fact of its name meaning, take, Language. Taking, taking it from Hebrews 1809, but also this with the Valley of Sorek. Yeah. And so the Valley of Sorek is this uh, vine. Right. But it's also the same as Hebrew 8321. Okay. Now, when we're looking at this 8321, it's only used three times. Okay. Genesis 49 11 being the first. And this was not a doubling in the Hebrew because the verse reads, binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Mm hmm. Now, the first reference to vine there is Hebrews 16, 12. But now it's said a second time as being the choice vine. And we have this same thing repeated technically in Isaiah 5, 2. And then it's expanded upon in Jeremiah 2, 2, 1. Okay. <clears throat> so is this Sorek, the Valley of Sorek, the Valley of the Choicest Noble Vine, is this giving us a symbolic representation of Christ? Well, yes. I mean, that all fits in with what we're saying. So in Jeremiah 2, 21, it says, Yet I had planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? Right. And the one in Isaiah 5, what was the verse? 5, 2. Yeah. And he fenced it, gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it. So there you have uh, this idea of the cross. Right. He also made a wine press therein. And that wine press, of course, he trod the wine press alone. Right. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Right. And the wild grapes that, we're, that they're addressing there mm -hmm. are technically, if if we were to look at that, it would not be a better, would not a better translation instead of wild grapes be poison berries? Well, possibly, though a grape is not a berry, but. Right. But yeah, something that's that's not healthy. Can uh, I, I ask a question real quick? Yeah, of course. So um, you gave us a Hebrew reference of eight something um, earlier. Eight three, four, one. eight, three, four, one, the Hebrew number, or one, six. Are you talking about the 1612? Okay, you said eight, three, four, one. Is that what you said? Oh, eight, three, two, one. Pardon me. Eight three two one. Okay, I, I was having problems finding the. That's going to be the choice vine, I think. Okay. And then sixteen uh, twelve is another one. Right, because in Genesis forty nine eleven, which is Jacob's pronouncement to his sons, correct? Mm hmm. So who is noting as binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. Um, Judah? Uh, 
Is that that Judah? Yeah. Okay. Or am I mistaken? No, I think that's right. I'm just doing some other, looking at some other verses. So, um, um, definitely Judah. Okay. <clears throat> so here we're dealing with this in a in a symbolic method. Where's this? Um, it's in verse nine, 49, 11, right? Right. So if we if we look oh, at 49, 11. 9, yeah. 49, 9 gives us that Judah is a lion's whelp from yeah. the prey. My yeah. son art got up, he stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. So in this, the foal unto the vine and then the ass's colt unto the choice vine. As Christ rode into Jerusalem mm -hmm. on the colt of an ass, this mm -hmm. is being prefigured. Yeah. That he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. So washing his clothes or seeing the purified character of those grapes that would be his harvest. Mm -hmm. So all of this with the, the choice vine or choicest vine or the noble vine must point symbolically to Christ. Yes. And, and so this fits into exactly what we're, we're seeing here, here in Judges 16, as far as how we've understood this first message. So in order to be benefited by the second message, you have to have been benefited by the first, right? To receive the second message, you have to be benefited yes. by the first. And so the second message comes, and this relates to the symbolism of the understanding, I would say, of the spiritual application of July 18. That is, there's, uh, this is about, the first part's about the cross, of course, the cross of Christ. The second angel arriving is taking this July 18 symbol that's in the midst, right? In the midst of this week, so to speak. So again, it points us to April 5th, 2030, um, because that comes from the week of Christ's study. Um, but it's also tying us to that um, he loves this woman named Delilah. Right, which is July 18, 2020, but is languishing. So, so this is about this message. And, and we can see then the importance of this message, and especially of July 18, but all of the symbols, um, that comes to play in this arrival of the this second message. Now, we ha had started the study of the uh, the three angels' message, you know, quite a bit before this. So, I was just trying to look up uh, these different dates. Um, of the, the study. So, you know, to me, this is part it has to do with the, the message of righteousness by faith in its prominence within the movement. Right. 
So we've been studying righteousness by faith. Um, we started with our first study on uh, it was August 19th, 2022. Right? That's the first Friday that we had that study. So, so we've been studying this for a while, and but it is part of the message that's coming together. So we would have to mark when this second message arrives, when this understanding uh, comes about, what, what date are we going to place the arrival of this second message? Or are we going to just argue that this is just a summation of the first three verses? But it's not. It's, it's introducing a new... Uh, a new message. But it's a message that we already understand. I mean, it's this woman, Delilah, who lives in the valley of Sorek, right, which is this vine. So this is about this movement, right? And um, the way that I look at it is that I see December 25th, uh, 2022 as the arrival of the second message that's going to be when we begin the studies on the line simply presented but it's connected to an invitation to the movement okay now i have a i have an odd observation okay when we look at this regarding the valley of sorek yeah of course, the, the Hebrew word Sorek is 7796. Yeah. But this is from the Hebrew word 8321. Right. Right? Yeah. Now, the, the thing that I find intriguing and I'm standing ready to be corrected. First off, 8321 and 7796 are different by the number 525. Oh. Second, there is a progression when you look at Genesis 4911, where you have the choice vine to Isaiah 5.2, where you have the choicest vine, to Jeremiah 2.2.1, where you have the noble vine, but you have this, this fourth one here in Judges 16.4, which is Sorek, which is supposed to mean the same thing. So, can't the representation that we're having here of 4911, 52, and 221 give us symbolically the first, second, and third angel's message, and Sorek give us Revelation 18.4. Okay. Um, so I, I couldn't follow all, all of that. So one thing is we have this Hebrew number. Uh, 8321. Yeah, that I know. So 8321 and the... Take seven. from that 7796. So I'm going to have to put the minus sign there. Right? Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And now, now it tied us to these other verses. Right. Now, we're in the 525 there. Now, remember, it's December 25th, 2021 is the end of the 525. This is like an anniversary of that. So the Correct. anniversary, which we marked, is marked with this symbolic number. So that comes from Judges 16, verse 4. Uh, and this is the word Sorek. Um, and its origins. Now, it, it, and it's kind of interesting uh, to me, because when you look up, um, uh, so the first one was uh, seven, 
seven seven nine six, right? Right. And that is it's Sorek, right? And you look at the the Hebrew, it's it's a shin uh, with the dot at the beginning of the shin or the end, whichever way you're reading it. Uh, a vav, a resh, and uh, a kof. And, and then if you go to 8321, well, it's, you know, it's further down the line, but it says, it you know, it's the same word, right? But, you know, they're, they're basically spelt the same. So the question is, why are these two different uh, Hebrew numbers in Strong's for basically the same word? Right. Does that make sense? So you know, I agree. Yeah. So if I look this up in Hebrew, this this verse, um, um, Judges sixteen verse four. Um, I gotta move this over for whatever reason. That doesn't make sense. Okay, so. It doesn't have the vav in it, but you know it still starts with the same letter with the the shin, right? And it says seven seven nine six. Sorek, so it's the the valley of Sorek. But if I look at, um, well, let's look. Up, uh, oops. Let's again. Eight, three, two, one. Sorry about that. And I look at, um, well, an example of, we'll look at it where it was first used, Genesis 49, 11. And we're just going to see in the Hebrew, it's um, it's going to have a letter in front of it, or two letters actually. Well, it's going to have uh, a lamet and a vav in in this here itself. But but that's just um, part of the grammatical structure of the sentence, right? So it's it's still. It doesn't make sense to me that this is a different Hebrew number, <laughs> right? It's the same word. But Strong's gives it two different Hebrew numbers. So why does he do that? I have no idea at this point. I'd have to probably dig into it a little further. Well, the message that, that Sister Angela put in the chat. Yeah. After the cross, he rose to return to his father. After Pentecost, the early church went to attend to the vine, which was languishing. Mm -hmm. Now, right now, in our studies, in all that we've been dealing with, mm -hmm. we have many that have been within the movement that are not choosing to study in this manner. Mm -hmm. when, when we look at what's been going on with Colin's study, yeah, and we look at the studies of so many others, can we not see the same situation with these studies as we would see right after the great disappointment of October 22nd, 1844. Mm -hmm. I mean, Colin's study right now is not that different in scope than those that continued to set a date for the return of Christ. Yeah. And then so many of the other studies 
are not that different from those that chose to accept part of what had been said, but go off in different directions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we seem so, to be in that same situation. Right. And we noticed this back, I mean, quite a long time ago, um, you know, in understanding early writings, page 74. So. Right. <clears throat> so we're in a situation right now where we have not only been repeating Millerite history, we are repeating what came immediately after Millerite history. Have we yet reached the point of those that had continued to study that came to a realization such as did those that continued to gather together did in from 1846 to 1850. Yeah, well, even after 1850, but I mean, it's, yeah, anyway, go on. Well, the point that I'm making with the, with the regarding 1850, when you have the 1850 chart, you have where the Millerite Adventists were being prepared to go out to give another message, right? That's why they made the chart. Yeah. Correct. Okay. And then when they're ready to go out and give that message, you still have this time setting going on, the date for November of 1851. Right. That's what Alan White is, is really fighting against. Correct. Right. So so we didn't we didn't understand our disappointment, what it meant and what's coming. And instead, we we're trying to um, vindicate it by saying, well, it's just delayed. It's going to happen here or it's going to happen there. Related to the idea of time set. So the idea that Trump has to become uh, the president in order for that to be fulfilled would be rejecting our message. Exactly. Which is the point I've made for a long time. Because we need to understand how it was fulfilled. It, that means we need to understand the lines. And, and this is what the study of the judges, more specifically than anything else, has given us, is this understanding of the lines and how they work um, and where we are right now. So we know we're under the proclamation then of this second angel message. Well, it's arrived on December 25th, 2022. And that in order to be benefited by this message, we have to have accepted these first messages, Collins, Odilios. And that was empowered with this November 24th, 2022 symbol. <clears throat> So, so how do we, how do we proceed? Um, with this, with this study. How do we how do we uh, take this? Well, as as you're showing, as we've been discussing about this line, mm -hmm. sixteen one, we're applying that with darkness, but we've also placed seven 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 there and at the arrival of the first angel's message, right? Yeah. With this now on the arrival of the second angel's message, we have given 
a prima facie establishment of the 525. What's missing? 252? Right. Okay. Now, I would presume that we will find the 252 on the arrival of the third angel's message. Okay. Now, so, now, when we discovered this 2688, I, I believe that was on November 24th, right? 2020. Right. Um, if I remember correctly. Um, so, because we, that's why we examined it the number of days, and then we looked up this number, if I remember correctly. So, so on December 25th, 2022, we have, you're saying we have this vine, which is 525. I still don't fully understand why when the third angel's message arrives, we understand the 252. I'm looking at a pattern. Okay. So if the, if the pattern is that the seven goes seven, backwards, it goes backwards. Correct. Okay. Or as, as I could say, chiastically. Yeah. Because we get the end of the 777 marking the beginning of something. Okay. So it would just seem like we have we have a little bit more work to do to continue establishing this line. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm trying to say is how do we how do we then get this uh, sorted out? Um, Okay, so here's an interesting little detail. <clears throat> so you're arguing that this is um, this chiastic structure. Okay, yes. Now, <clears throat> um, so we don't know what this means here as far as the future. We don't, we don't have a lot of information on this because um, the future is kind of... Uh, shadowy but let's say we put um here um october 8th um i don't know so october 8th 2030 so you know we haven't got there yet but that is the day of atonement in um, <clears throat> 2030, right? It's the 10th day of the seventh month. Now, now that's the arrival of the third angel's message. Um, and think here. So, I mean, that's where I would put the third angel arriving. If, if I was, you know, just looking at it this line, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's the fourth angel arriving or something like that. But, um, you know, how would that relate then to the, if that's the case, how would that relate to the 252? I mean, you would have the 2520 that ends in 1844. And if you go back from, if you go to the 10th day of the seventh month in 1844, 
that's going to be 2300 months uh, to the 10th day of the seventh month in 2030, right? Because we'd always been looking at, you know, the first day of the first month. But this, this brings us to the 10th day of the seventh month. So that does give us the 252. If the third angel arriving is October 8th, 2030, as a symbol. Yet, when we're looking at this, we have, now I, I can agree that this would be a day of atonement. But if we're following it specifically, yeah, we're also recognizing that this must be established as a day where the warning of the judgment of God is addressed. Okay, yeah. So then this date we already had before, okay? That is, if I took, um, uh, what was it? When we did that study dealing with the first day of the first month to the first day of the first month, I'm going to try to find my chart here. First uh, day of the first month to the first to first day of the first month. I don't get it. In 457 BC. All right. Right. So that we're going to, that's from Ezra 7 to 10, right? We, we start on the first day of the first month. He leaves Babylon, and then they finish the divorcement on the first day of the first month. So we had lined that up with September 11th to 2030. Right? So people remember that? All right. Uh, so I'm just trying to find the sheet here. There's what I want. Um, so this is going to go back to this paper. Sorry, this. So I'll share the screen here. <clears throat> okay, it's not doing what it's supposed to. Just a minute. This is the one I wanted. Okay. <clears throat> So we took the first day of the first month and we did it in different ways. We started with months, lunar months. And we started on the month in which 9-11 occurs. That is, it, that month began on August 22nd, 2001 and ended September 20th, 2001, right? And so we said that that month is representing the first day of the first month so that there's a day for a month and then we just kept counting through the 354 months which represents the 354 days and that brought us to the first day of the first month is april 5th 2030 so that's one way in which we could use a day for a month to relate to um April 5th, 2030, the first day of the first month. So we're taking Ezra 7 to 10. We're taking that 354 days that are represented there. And we're showing them here. I mean, technically 355, if you count the first day of the first month, it's the 355th day from when he leaves Babylon. And that brought us to April 5th, 2030. The other way we did it is we used 354 months as prophetic months, that is months of 30 days. And we started on 9-11 itself as the first day of the first month, because 9-11, we understand, is the first day of the first month, right? As a symbol. That connects us to April uh, 19th, 1844, with the first day of the first month, the fifth day of the fourth month, the first day of the fifth month, and the tenth day of the seventh month. So when we did this and we counted 354, uh, 
354 prophetic months, it brought us to the 10th day of the seventh month in 2030. So that means the story of Ezra brings us to Millerite history and connects 2300 months to the day from, those are lunar months, from April 19th, 1844 to April 5th, 2030. But we know we could also count 2300 months from the Day of Atonement in 1844 to the Day of Atonement in 2030, right? So both of these dates are being marked in, in Ezra 7 to 10. Does that make, is that clear to everyone? what I did there. So we can't ignore the 10th day of the seventh month because it is also marked in the story Ezra 7 to 10, just as the first day of the first month is. Right, And the thing about Ezra 7 to 10 is it gives us Millerite history. It gives us those dates, right? And, and, and so it gives us those dates in Millerite history, and it gives us these dates in our history. Does that make sense, Dwight? Kind of looks that way. Yeah. So I don't think that we can ignore that we have April 5th, 2030. But we definitely can't ignore that we also have October 8th, 2030. Right, because that that's also marked. So whether that is going to be the third angel arriving in our chart, I'm just saying that if it is, it does mark what you are suggesting, the 252. That is the 2520. But it's the anniversary of the end of the 2520 by 186 years, right? Because that's the other thing that connects us from 1844 to 2030 is from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, it's 186 cardinal days. 10th day of the seventh month is the 187th day. So this would be the start of the 187th year. So October 8th, 2030 is, you know, another, what we're doing, to me, this is so remarkable, is that we can take the symbols in 1844 that led us to October 22nd, 1844, and also to April 19th, 1844. And we, we have those symbols, and they lead us in all these different ways through the July 18, 2020 prediction to these dates in the future. And this is the primary thing that, that God has been showing us in the story of the judges, is it points to 2030. Now, the problem that we have there is we know that we can't set time. Right? So we don't know if those dates are just symbolic to represent something for us to understand, or if they are actual dates that, that apply to this movement. But what we can't what we can't do is we can't set dates for external events. That's our belief, right? So we're not going to say, oh, well, this is the Sunday law. The Sunday law is going to happen on October 8th, 2030 year. Things like that. Because we've, we've gone through that before. And I believe that we've been clearly shown in all of our studies, and, and especially in early writings, page 74, you know, that there is no further reckoning of the prophetic periods. So we can't just say, well, you know, they were partly fulfilled in 1844, but this is the true fulfillment and all the things that the Millerites had predicted we're now going to predict as, you know, happening in 2030 or something like that, right? So we can't do that. So we have to cut, to grapple with what this actually means to this movement. And, and one of the things that it does mean to me, whether you all agree or not, 
is that what's being looked for right now in this movement, the Sunday law being imminent, would be uh, the parallel to that is when in 1850, you know, Ellen White has this vision on October 23rd, you know, the, the anniversary to Hiram Edson seeing Christ move from the holy to the most holy place. Um, says it's September 23rd, but we know it's October 23rd that she has this vision. And it's going to be published in the, the Review and Herald on, uh, in November, Present Truth. And um, so that publication of that, you know, is this warning also about this time setting that's coming in November of 1851. And, and so we're paralleling that. We're saying that that what you're expecting is not going to happen. So we can see what, what's presently being predicted regarding the Sunday law in this movement is incorrect because it is a rejection of, you know, October 22, 1844, or July 18, 2020. So that's where we're leading to these dates in the future, whether literal, you know, events occur there or this is just symbolic, we don't know. But I would say that, that we have to see that that's what's coming. So we have this December 25th, I'm saying that when we made that invitation, uh, you know, like on the 24th and then on the 25th, we began the study of the lines uh, simply presented. Um, and, and we have this, you know, when I would say that there's a formalization of this, I would think that that comes at this camp meeting that's coming up, or maybe it's an empowerment. Maybe there's something that formalizes it prior to that. Maybe the formalization is the announcement that the camp meeting's coming or something. But all I see is that what we're going to be led to is these events are going to happen here in this year, right? This formalization and this empowerment. And maybe, maybe not this year, but soon anyway. Um, but this is going to lead to us understanding this history that's coming, right? So it's future, what this prediction means to this movement. And so with an empowerment of a message, we should be able to proclaim a message. And I don't think it's a time message, you know, that on such and such a date, something's going to happen. But I would think that what it's, it, it is, um, is this giving of this message that's still going to be accomplished in, in the future. That's how I would understand this. That's what I see that we've been being taught. So any thoughts on that? I think we're gonna have a lot more really to put some more data in play and in place on this line. Yeah. Now. So regarding the camp meeting that's coming up, um, yes. I've been praying lots about it. Um, um, well, this Sabbath, we're, uh, Heidi and I are going to be in Warburg because uh, it's, it's our wedding anniversary, April 8th. Um, but uh, so we're going to visit some of our relatives there. Um, that's sort of my anniversary gift that we get to visit people. But uh, anyway... Um, what I want to do with the, the groups that uh, the American and the Canadian group is, and I haven't really done it other than, you know, I told them that we're going to have this camp meeting, but we need to make an invitation. But this invitation need, needs to be much more explicit. That is, we need to tell them what it is that we have found in some sort of summary way, um, a very succinct way, just 
very briefly and that this needs to be studied together. And it, they need to know that we accept Collins and Odilio's studies. Right. So they need to understand what it is we're going to be doing, what it is we're going to be presenting. Um, now, I don't know. I don't think I'm the person to present that. I mean, personally, I think Dwight's the person to present that. But, you know, that's my opinion. Um, I don't know what you think about that, Dwight. I, I was just sitting back smiling. <laughs> Also, oh, you're happy to present it then to the to the groups. I, I was smiling because you have a very interesting sense of humor. <laughs> OK, well, it wasn't a sense of humor. It's serious. I, I recognize it's serious, but it's also a sense of humor. Oh, OK. <laughs> but I have to agree with Dwight. Yeah, OK. But just, you know, if I think about the different people in our group, no offense to anyone else, but, um, and when we also all have a history uh, with them, right? I mean, to some degree with different people. So but I just think Dwight could present it in a, in a way that has what, more authority, more force or power than if I presented it. Um, well, A, they're not going to listen. They're going to be so, they're going to be, this is just the attitude that I've noticed is that uh, when you speak, uh, the eyes roll back in the back of their head. And um, the first thing that comes into their mind is all this terrible stuff they associate with you. Right. This yeah. is just, this is just my, this is just me noticing this stuff. Yeah. So Dwight has more respect. He, he, I would say so. So that's, um... you know, I've, I've, I've been working on a rapport with Paul and, and Bonnie and the rest of them, mm -hmm. uh, trying to present our understanding of, to how we get what we get, you know, how we get from point A to point B. And the most of that has been um, trying to understand the, relationships of line upon line mm -hmm. um, it the things that that we talk about in a knowledgeable uh, way between us is not the way they talk to each other mm -hmm. okay they they have for the things that we say they've got other ideas and so i've been working on trying to smooth out some of them ripples like the the line upon line thing they're they're seeing one progressive long line where we're seeing in scriptures each each one of the scriptures has its own line in mm -hmm. what relationship in whatever relationship it is yeah so i'm not so sure that they they're they're getting that um uh, because of the I don't know. It's it's not necessarily resistance, but um, certain people have certain attitudes. Well, I don't like it sounding like that. Uh, I more prefer it like this. Although we're talking about the same thing, um, we're just some people don't like to hear certain things about certain things in a certain manner, uh, and that's what I've noticed. Okay. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm sorry, what did you say? I said I'll back that up. There is just so much laziness intellectually and spiritually. There's so much subjectivism. There's so much personal opinion. How can we be judging the word of God? What did Ellen White say about that? I mean, are we suddenly G.I. Butler and... Uh, uh, what's his face? <laughs> the name escapes me at the moment. Smith. I mean, let's just look at the word and let the word lead. Let the word explain itself. That's the biggest problem I see too. Is uh, 
is, is you know, you get a you get fixed on um, adjectives and pronouns <laughs> to, to kind of put it uh, in that term. At least that's what I've noticed. I don't know, you know, how we're going to be able to approach that other than being consistent. And, um, you know, I, I've been putting things together off of what you've been talking about, um, Theodore. Mm -hmm. uh, some certain, like, you'll be going over something and you can, you, you'll, like, uh, give a summary as to how we got to a certain place and why we were there and so i I've, I've taken that verbiage and written it down and so at times when i'm talking with them i say those things just like you said them um and th there's no offense when i say them but if you would have said them I i'm i'm sure i'm i'm positive that there would have been a lot of disgruntledness going on so mm -hmm. Yes, somebody has to be able to present this stuff to them. Um, whether whoever it is, it just has to be consistent yeah. um, with with what we with what we um, have been finding, how we've been finding it, um, our reasonings for certain things, especially when you know they'll go, well, how this come up, you know, well, we need to be able to explain it. And that's what I've been trying to do is put all that stuff together so I can explain it because, you know, they pop up. Uh, Bonnie especially pops off with some questions that I just, you know, make me go, uh, well, well, this was a mistake because I, I can't explain that. But then I got to go away and I got to figure out what it was and how um, to explain it. So I, I have a communications with email back and forth with Bonnie on certain things. We're going through something right now which is what makes me say some of this stuff about, um, you know, we're, we're saying things, we're saying it one way, uh, they hear it another way, but they'll talk about the same stuff in a different way, yeah. but it's and, the same. Yeah. Okay. So this is from uh, fifth testimonies, Heidi and I reading fifth testimonies. Now this is talking about parents and and the example that they're supposed to have for their children mm -hmm. um so it says these youth finally lose all respect for the sabbath and have no rel relish for religious meetings or for sacred and eternal things if their parents mildly mildly remonstrate with them they shield themselves by telling of the faults of some of the church members in place of silencing the first approach to anything of the kind, the parents think just as the children think. If this one or that one were perfect, their children would be right. Instead of this, they should teach them that the sins of others are no excuse for them. Christ is the only true pattern. The wrongs of many would not excuse one wrong in them or lessen in the least their guilt. God has given them one standard, perfect, noble, elevated. This they must meet, irrespective of the course which others may pursue. But many parents seem to lose reason and judgment in their fondness for their children. And through these indulged, selfish, mismanaged youth, Satan, is tur Satan in turn effectu effectually works effectually to ruin the parents. I was referred to the wrath of God, which came upon the incredulous and disobedient of the ancient Israel. Their duty to instruct their children was plainly enjoined upon them. It is just as binding upon believing parents in the this generation. Now, when we look at, from my perspective, we look at this movement, um, we act like children. I mean, I've used the illustration like children in the schoolyard, you know, after a fight. I um, agree. But we, we point out the errors and the flaws of others as if that discredits what they are saying and also justifies us in our attitude towards others, which is destructive. And, you know, we're not mature. We're not grown up. And, and this movement is in terrible shape because we 
are not Christians. We're not converted. And God has given us a message which is supposed to restore us. It's a message of restoration, revival, reformation, right? And yet, we right. Think we think it applies to someone else. We are the ones going through the reform line, right? We yes. are the ones that are supposed to be reformed. And yes. yet we think it applies to somebody else. And, and so this is the problem that we face. And, you know, I, on the chart here, so I, I just, you know, going a little bit over time, but. Uh, on the chart that I put here, you can see I put April 5th. No, that shouldn't be April 5th. It should be April 8th. So this Sabbath, you know, we're going to present this message. Dwight's going to do that uh, to the Canadian or American group, whichever group it is this week. I think it's the American group this week, but it could be wrong. Um, and then we got July 24th. That's going to be the camp meeting. So I put this ahead of time. That's the formalization and empowerment of this message that was uh, given on December 25th, 2022, or arri arrived then. And, you know, I could be wrong about this, but I'm just saying that this is really what should happen. That this message should be empowered at that camp meeting. Right? This movement should have a message and be working and united together to give a message about something in the future, symbolically the Day of Atonement. Right? The Sunday Law. And if this movement isn't ever going to become united on this point, it will be passed by. And we need to study these messages, Colin's message, Adilio's message, all of the things that we found in our studies, those need to be presented. People need to be able to accept that message in order to move forward. Okay, so we're going to close with prayer. We'll come back to this tomorrow morning. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning and for what you're teaching us. Help us to recognize the seriousness of this matter and our responsibility and to take up that responsibility according to thy will. Be with each person. May your angels watch over us. May your Holy Spirit continue to speak to our hearts and bring a conviction and a power. And uh, we pray for each one in this movement. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen.